All right. Majority of the votes for B or C, red supergiant or red giant. Yeah, it turns out this is the red supergiant. So this is a larger um, total envelope size than for our lower mass stars that ascended up the giant branch. So we're here, a red supergiant star. This is the early evolutionary process of a high mass star. And remember, high mass means uh, around two solar masses or above. All right, so we've burned through helium in the star. We've gone through our red um, supergiant phase. And now eventually our star starts to increase again in temperature. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but eventually carbon will ignite as we come, uh, as the temperature increases in the star. Um, and so that is our, again, carbon fusion process for the high mass star. But where our low mass stars had to go through a helium flash to get there, the high mass star just goes straight to carbon fusion or to helium burning. All right, and then it can, again, go straight from helium burning to carbon burning. So the, uh, the core of the star is getting smaller and smaller, hotter and hotter, um, just in a fairly continuous way, burning heavier and heavier elements as it does so. Okay, eventually we reach another turnaround point on our diagram. So what do you suppose this is? Oops, I meant to do that. All right, so our answer here is A, we're actually at our blue supergiant phase now. So we've gone from red supergiant to higher temperatures, uh, blue supergiant. Um, it is, you know, if you consider the diagonals here, the red supergiant is larger here than the blue supergiant is but it's still gonna be within that category. So this, this is the um, origin of all the supergiant stars in that branch, in that luminosity class. It's all aging high mass stars. Whereas the stars that are in the giant um, luminosity class, those are aging low mass stars. All right. If we wanted to see this really clearly, we could look at cluster HR diagrams, right? And find these stars specifically. Okay. So we've ignited helium, we've burned through helium, we've ignited, ignited carbon, and now we're burning carbon. Eventually the high mass stars even get warm, um, hot enough to have more nuclear reactions than that. Um, sometimes they'll go supernova. If they're lower mass stars, they'll go supernova sooner than the higher mass stars uh, because they will have a buildup in their core and that becomes catastrophic. But if you're um, a higher mass star, you can keep burning through more elements before you go supernova. Okay. I think I did want to say one more thing here. So the, the reason that you can burn through more elements as, for higher mass stars is because they just have more gravity pushing in. And so even as the core continues to shrink, the, the gravity from the highest mass stars can continue compressing the core to higher and higher temperatures, and that will allow them to burn heavier and heavier materials. So the, the only reason that they can, you know, get this far without gianting is because they can still build up high temperatures and spark the combustion, not combustion, the fusion of a new material. Okay. So I want to just show you all the different elements that we can create in our high mass stars. Um, so we've got, of course, our helium and our carbon, which our low mass stars could do as well for the most part. And then for high mass stars in particular, um, you get a considerable amount of oxygen built up from the CNO cycle. Um, and then if we start here from our CNO cycle, if the star is a low mass star, it becomes a planetary nebula. Um, but if it's a higher mass star, more than eight solar masses, then you can actually get some more fun fusion products like sodium, neon, and magnesium. And then um, for, I guess, low mass, high mass stars, less than 10 solar masses, this is the end of the road and they will explode as a supernova. But for stars that are more massive than that, they can actually fuse the oxygen into silicon and then iron. And iron fusion is really the end of the road. This is really bad for stars. Um, iron actually takes more energy to fuse. So instead of releasing energy during fusion, it actually requires energy during fusion. And this soaks up energy on the interior of the star 
and destabilizes the core. And this leads to fabulous supernova explosions. All right, so this is pretty much all of the fusion that high mass stars are capable of doing. But you'll notice we have other elements around us like gold and silver and platinum and all kinds of things that are heavier than iron. And so these are actually forged in supernova explosions um, during that extreme high energy process. Um, they're not formed during the normal fusion process in the core. Okay, so for the most high mass stars, we continue burning heavier and heavier elements and they just become ridiculously large over time. And again, they, they have different shells of burning. So they'll have hydrogen shell. Inside of that, they'll have helium. Inside of that, carbon, and then oxygen, and then silicon on the very inside. And when iron builds up on the inside, that's the death knell, and that's when we go supernova. OK, and we'll talk about supernovae next week. All right, so that's pretty much it for the um, evolution of stars. It's all about what's happening inside the star, specifically how the fusion rates are occurring, what's burning, and how that affects the interior and the exterior of the star. So I'm going to try to recap this, and it's still a little bit dense, so bear with me. So we knew before that stars leave the main sequence when hydrogen becomes depleted in their course. And now to add to that, we know that the temperature and pressure of the star's core are changing as different fuels become unavailable. So as ashes build up um, and then as new fuels become available in shells that get hot enough to ignite. Um, and these changes in temperature and pressure, they drive structural changes. And in turn, that leads to the differences that we see on the HR diagram. So any of the motion on the HR diagram is because of structural changes inside the star. And then finally, our lowest mass stars end up with a planetary nebula and that eventually disperses, but the white dwarf um, remains hot for a long time. Eventually it would cool, but our universe is too young for any white dwarf to have cooled considerably. 